Hey guys and welcome to How to Gastro. Today we will be talking about esophagitis. The esophagus is the tube that carries food from the throat to the stomach and esophagitis is the irritation or inflammation of the esophagus. Mild esophagitis will show microscopic changes of the mucosa and infiltration with granulocytes or eosinophils and might show endoscopic abnormalities. Erosive esophagitis shows marked redness, friability, bleeding, superficial linear ulcers and exudates. In the picture on the right you can see the layers of the esophagus on transverse section and you can see here the innermost layer which is called the mucosa and uh, the second innermost which is called the submucosa uh, that is where esophagitis actually occurs and it's the irritation of these layers here which are the innermost layers of the esophagus and at the bottom here you can see what esophagitis would look like on an esophagoscopy which is basically an endoscopy but just shows the esophagus so you can see here the the irritation, the, the marked redness, the friability, uh, bleeding and you can also see here this looks like a bit of ulcer formation. What are the causes of esophagitis? Gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD is the most common cause of esophagitis. When a patient has GERD, the stomach acid and juices flow backward into the esophagus and this can cause irritation to the lining of the esophagus and you can see down here at the bottom that acid pushing up is definitely going to irritate the esophagus because the esophagus is, is not used to that acidic environment the stomach is designed to to handle that acidic environment but the esophagus is not and that's something very important to keep in mind and that is why esophagitis actually occurs because the acid rushing up here in gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD actually causes inflammation and irritation to that lining of the esophagus. So there's actually a specific grading system which is used to grade the severity of reflux esophagitis and this is the Los Angeles classification and in grade one we have one or more mucosal breaks less than five millimeters in maximum length. Grade B is one or more mucosal breaks more than five millimeters in length but without continuity across mucosal folds. Grade C is mucosal breaks continuous between more than two mucosal folds but involving less than 75% of the esophageal circumference. And grade D is mucosal breaks involving more than 75% of the esophageal circumference. So continuing with the causes of esophagitis, we could also have medications such as aspirin, or other anti-inflammatory drugs and here NSAIDs are usually known they have a bad reputation for actually causing esophagitis and stomach ulcers and gastritis so always remember that the esophagus and stomach don't handle the chronic use of NSAIDs very well. Taking a large pill with too little water or just before bedtime where fragments can get stuck in the throat so usually if a tablet is stuck on the side of the esophagus that's going to cause some inflammation and irritation to the lining of the esophagus. Uh, swallowing a toxic substance and usually these substances are caustic substances occurring most frequently in suicidal patients or accidental ingestion of toxic liquids. We could also have vitamin and mineral supplements such as vitamin C, iron and potassium pills that can cause esophagitis. Antibiotics such as clindamycin and tetracycline. We could also have hernias and most frequently we have hiatal hernias uh, which cause a lot of heartburn and acid reflux. And in the beginning I mentioned that one of the most common causes of esophagitis is GERD or uh, gastric reflux. So we can definitely draw the correlation between hiatal hernias and esophagitis as well. Uh, we could also have radiotherapy injury and these are common in patients who are undergoing radiotherapy to treat other intrathoracic tumors or malignancies. Symptoms of esophagitis. So we could have difficult and or painful swallowing, 
especially if there is a feeling of food getting stuck on the way down and this is called dysphagia. We can have heartburn, acid reflux or unpleasant taste in the mouth which is regurgitation. We could have sore throat or hoarseness, painful swallowing, odonophagia, difficulty in swallowing, dysphagia, mouth sores, nausea, vomiting or indigestion, chest pain in the middle of the chest which often radiates to the back and it's usually associated with swallowing or soon after a meal. We could have bad breath, which is halitosis, and we could have excessive belching. So how is esophagitis diagnosed? The first thing we need to take into consideration, of course, is our patient's presenting symptoms. And usually the patient will present with heartburn, acid reflux, dysphagia, and all the symptoms I mentioned earlier. So this can be helpful in assisting us with the diagnosis. We could also perform an esophagoscopy, which is uh, a thin flexible tube which is placed down the throat and into the esophagus. And this test can also allow the gastroenterologist to take a sample of their cells and to test for an infection. And I'll get back to the infection later on, but usually on an esophagoscopy, erosive esophagitis will show marked redness, friability, bleeding, superficial linear ulcers and exudates. And sometimes a small piece of tissue is removed and is sent to a lab to check for the presence of inflammatory cells or cancer cells as well. Continuing with diagnostic procedures, we could also do a barium swallow and this is an x-ray image of the esophagus and before the x-ray the patient drinks a chalky liquid substance which is called barium and barium coats the inside of the esophagus so that it shows up better on an x-ray and on the left here you could see what a normal esophagus looks like on barium swallow and on the right you can see what the barium swallow looks like in an esophagitis and you can see here we have thick esophageal mucosal folds which you can see in white arrows and we also have an ulcer uh, which has developed and the ulcer here is shown as that collection of barium usually barium will stick to that ulcer and collect in there so it'll be more radiopaque so you'll be able to see it on the x-ray and you can see that inflammation and the ulcer the right there that's very common in patients with esophagitis we could also do ph studies which is basically an electrode that is placed above the lower esophageal sphincter and this records the changes in pH over a 24-hour period. And I mentioned earlier that the esophagus is not a very acidic environment at all. So during a 24-hour pH study, if we have really decreased dropped levels of the pH, which is basically an acidic environment uh, recorded in the esophagus, then we know that there's some kind of acid reflux that's happening there. And that could be very useful to diagnose an esophagitis. So how is esophagitis treated? The treatment required depends on what the cause of the esophagitis is. If the esophagitis is caused by acid reflux or GERD, the doctor will likely recommend a change in diet, weight loss and other lifestyle changes. Here are some things to try. A change of eating habits such as eating several small meals instead of two or three large meals, after eating, waiting two to three hours before laying down. Chocolate, mint and alcohol can make GERD worse because they relax the valve between the esophagus and the stomach, which is called the lower esophageal sphincter, and should therefore be avoided. Spicy foods, foods that have a lot of acid like tomatoes and oranges, and coffee can make GERD symptoms worse and should also be avoided. Also, large meals and fatty meals should be avoided. So these all fall under lifestyle changes that the patient can adapt to in their day-to-day -day routine. Now, a medical approach to treatment. If lifestyle changes alone aren't enough to help your esophagitis, the doctor may suggest medicines that reduce stomach acid. Antacids reduce stomach acid, such as Melox, Melanta, Jolucel, Gaviscon, and Rolaids. Medicines that block acid production and heal the esophagus which are called proton pump inhibitors or PPIs and some examples are esomeprazole, lanceprazole, omeprazole, pantaprazole, rabeprazole, 
and dexlanceprazole. We could also use medications to reduce acid production, which are called H2 receptor blockers, and these medications include cimetidine, formetidine, nizatidine, or ranitidine. And something to note here is the proton pump inhibitors are actually stronger blockers of acid production than the H2 receptor blockers. The picture on the right is gaviscon, which is an antacid. Below we have some examples of proton pump inhibitors. And lastly, we have some H2 receptor blockers. What are some complications of esophagitis? If left untreated, esophagitis can lead to changes in the structure of the esophagus. Possible complications include narrowing of the esophagus, which is called an esophageal stricture, or Barrett's esophagus, which is characterized by changes to the cells of the lining in the esophagus, increasing your risk of esophageal cancer. So I'm first going to talk about the esophageal stricture. And the picture above on the right, you can see here, if a patient comes into the clinic with chronic acid reflux, uh, because of their chronic irritation to that specific area in the esophagus, we're going to have a narrowing of the esophagus. And this narrowing is called a stricture. Secondly, because of that chronic reflux again, what actually happens is we have a change in the cells that line the esophagus or a metaplasia of cells. And eventually what happens is that these cells in the lower part of the esophagus, due to that chronic acidic environment that they are being forced to endure, start resembling the cells that line the intestine. So usually the, the lower part of the esophagus undergoes intestinal metaplasia. And I did a video on Barrett's esophagus, so I'm not going to go into great detail with it here, but I'll put a link in the description for it if you guys are interested in knowing what it's all about. But something to note here is that patients with Barrett's esophagus are actually prone to the risk of developing an adenocarcinoma. So Barrett's esophagus is a precancerous disease. So, so far I covered all the non-infectious causes of esophagitis and we've discussed GERD, we've discussed hernias, we discussed radiotherapy, etc, etc as causes of esophagitis, but we didn't actually cover any infectious causes. So now we're going to cover the infectious causes of esophagitis. Infections that can cause esophagitis may be due to bacteria, viruses or fungi. These usually occur because of diseases or other conditions that weaken the immune system, such as AIDS or steroid medications. These are some viral causes of infectious esophagitis. Herpes esophagitis, and this disease usually presents with an acute onset with chest pain, adenophagia, which is painful swallowing, dysphagia, which is a difficulty in swallowing, and there's also a bleeding risk in severe cases the persistent infection may lead to superinfection of denuded esophageal mucosa with fungi, bacteria, or to HSV pneumonia. Another viral cause of esophagitis is varicella zoster virus, which occurs most frequently in children with chickenpox or adults with herpes zoster. Cytomegalovirus can also be a cause of viral esophagitis, and this is usually acquired from a blood transfusion and shows up as serpiginous ulcers in an otherwise normal mucosa and can also be seen with giant ulcers in the distal esophagus and it also involves the submucosal fibroblasts and endothelial cells of the blood vessels but not the epithelial cells. HIV or human immunodeficiency virus is also a cause of infectious viral esophagitis. It is a self-limited syndrome of acute esophageal ulceration with or without oral ulcers and a maculopapular skin rash. It is most common in homosexual men. We could also have bacterial causes of infectious esophagitis. The most common causes of bacterial esophagitis are by lactobacilli or beta hemolytic streptococci. Immune compromised hosts are very susceptible to all different kinds of bacteria that could cause esophagitis. In patients with age, cryptosporidium, 
and pneumocystis carini may also cause non-specific inflammation of the distal esophagus. We could also have fungal causes of infectious esophagitis and this is usually caused by the candida species. The candida fungus esophagitis occurs most commonly in immune deficiency states such as HIV infected persons or patients with neoplasms. Below I put an esophagoscopy showing an example of what candida esophagitis would look like. So how is infectious esophagitis treated? If esophagitis is caused by bacteria, the doctor will prescribe antibiotics to treat the infection. If the esophagitis is caused by a virus, the doctor will prescribe antivirals to treat the infection. Acyclovir is usually used to treat herpes esophagitis. If the esophagitis is caused by a fungus, the doctor will prescribe an antifungal agent to treat the infection. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you found this presentation very informative. Please like, comment, subscribe and share. And if you would like to download a copy of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. I will include the links of the presentations done on GERD, Barrett's esophagus, as well as esophageal cancer. Thank you guys again and see you soon. Bye-bye.